Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on Synthesis Workshop. Today, we're joined by Soren Rosema and Jonas Hein. Soren Rosema is a PhD student in the lab of Dr. Scott Miller at Yale University. He received his BS in Pharmacology and Toxicology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2019, performing undergraduate research in the synthesis of inhibitors of toxoplasma with Dr. Jennifer Golden. His current research at Yale investigates the synthesis of novel catalytic residues for new modes of peptide catalysis. Jonas Hein is a PhD student in the research group of Professor Song Lin at Cornell University. He received his BS degree from Johannes Gutenberg University Mines under the supervision of Professor Waldvogel, developing electrochemical methods for dehydrogenated aerial functionalization. In 2019, he started his PhD studies supported by the ERP Fellowship. His current research interest is focused on novel aminoxyl radical peptide catalysis for asymmetric oxidation of alcohols and beyond, the development of technological solutions to facilitate high throughput experimentation for electrosynthesis and data chemistry. And with that, I'll let you both get started. Thank you for that kind introduction. Today, we're going to start our talk talking about asymmetric catalysis. As many of you are aware, enantiomeric compounds are found all over the place in nature, particularly within biologic systems. And that means uh, when we produce two enantiomeric forms of, of, of a compound, they can have wildly different biological activity. So as we see here, we have a minus carbone, which smells like peppermint seeds. And we have a plus carbone, which smells like caraway seeds. And this is, you know, a relatively trivial example of two enantiomeric compounds having different biological activity. But when we go to more complex systems, like normatrovir shown here, what we see is that all of these different stereocenters are important to the drug's biological activity. But if we were able to, you know, dose racemate, we would get diminished activity or potentially off-target effects. And so this is a real focus within the synthetic chemistry community. And the work that we're going to be talking about today focuses on these two stereocenters shown here and how we can um, access them using uh, some novel chemistry. So uh, asymmetric catalysis is a really powerful way of um, accessing new stereocenters. Um, and typically the workflow for asymmetric catalysis starts from a known achiral reaction, such as you know, the upjohn dihydroxylation or the Novonagel condensation. And through a lot of different efforts, we can develop new ligands, new catalytic moieties in order to render these transformations in antioselective. Um, and so Sharpless was able to render dihydroxylation in antioselective, these quinucleidine ligands, um, receiving the Nobel Prize in 2001. And organocatalysis uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2021 and has been a real powerful technique uh, used in the field. So within the Miller group, we have our own special brand of catalysis uh, using small catalytic peptides as a platform for catalysis design. So we take inspiration from nature. Nature uses uh, enzymes, which are large polypeptides. We can, in effect, miniaturize the active site of these, these molecules and, and use uh, tetrameric peptides. So typically we, we rely on this semi-rigid beta turn scaffold defined by this hydrogen bond shown here. And this allows us to get a semi-rigid scaffold to allow for high enantio differentiation through a number of different transformations. So typically in the group, we like to put a catalytic residue at the I plus one position. I mean, we've used a number of different catalytic residues, um, starting from a pimethylhistidine shown here, all the way to, to some really interesting uh, rhodium paddle wheel complexes and, and phosphoric acids. Um, and we've shown that through a number of different uh, mechanistic manifolds, we're able to achieve high enantioselectivity. And so when we started this project, we sought to expand what mechanistic manifolds we could accomplish. And we, we turned our attention to uh, the aminoxyl radical, as we'll see, is a very privileged organocatalyst uh, within this space. In the Lin Lab, we have a long-standing interest in aminoxyl radicals, which are bench-stable, isolable organic radicals, with the most famous representative being Tempo. The stability of the radicals results from the delocalization of the spin density across the oxygen and nitrogen atom of the aminoxyl moiety. They are also uniquely able to support three redox states connected by reversible single electron transfers. As such, the aminoxyl radicals can be oxidized to isolable oxymonium salts or reduced to their respective hydroxylamines. 
Aside from single electron redox chemistry, aminoxyl radicals also support various two electron polar elementary steps, such as attack of oxyammonium by nucleophiles, or alternatively, the nucleophilic hydroxylamine can attack oxidants or carbocations. The oxyammonium cation can, for instance, also further serve as an azide group transfer catalyst in alkenedite functionalizations developed in our lab. All of this mechanistic diversity makes aminoxyl radicals really privileged organocatalysts for redox chemistry. The most well-studied reaction catalyzed by oxyammonium cations is the oxidation of alcohols to aldehydes, typically with excellent turnover numbers and a broad functional group tolerance. The reaction proceeds via a two-electron mechanism and is initiated by the oxidation of an aminoxyl radical precatalyst or a hydroxylamine to the corresponding oxyammonium by either a chemical oxidant such as TCCA or electrochemistry. This oxyammonium then undergoes a nucleophilic attack by alcohol in the presence of base, resulting in an oxyammonium alkoxide adduct. This adduct then undergoes a rate-determining cope-type elimination, delivering the aldehyde product and regenerating the hydroxylamine. In the context of asymmetric catalysis, our reaction of interest is the oxidative desymmetrization of mesodiols. Here, a mesodiol is oxidized once to furnish a chiral aldehyde, which then undergoes a cyclization to the intermediate lactol. This lactol can either be isolated or undergo a second oxidation to a chiral lactone in the presence of excess oxidant. Both lactols and lactones have high synthetic value and have been utilized in numerous total synthesis and medicinal chemistry efforts, which motivated us to develop a suitable chiral aminoxyl radical for this transformation. So when we decided to enter this campaign, we sought to establish a new chiral aminoxyl radical. Aminoxyl radicals were first made chiral by uh, Bobbitt in 1993, um, who utilized this catalyst shown here for the desymmetrization of MISA 1,4 diols. Rignovsky and Toniolo uh, also established themselves in this field with their own independent uh, syntheses of catalysts. Uh, but really, the state of the art when we decided to um, enter this space was work of Iwabuchi in 2014, who used an aza adamantane core for uh, kinetic resolution of secondary alcohols um, with, with high enantioselectivities. So although this is a really fantastic catalyst uh, within its own reaction domain, what we see is that synthesis of analogs of this catalyst are, are quite lengthy. So the chiral information is introduced at step four of a 14-step synthesis. And so generation of analogs would be quite challenging. And so we decided to establish a new catalytic residue that could be appended to a peptide backbone. So shown here is the core we settled on. So we, we call it ask OME. It is a readily pre prepared bench stable solid um, only requiring seven steps with one chromatographic step to generate this methyl ester, which could then be hydrolyzed uh, and appended to a diverse array of peptide backbones for ready synthesis of a catalyst library. So we were able to prepare over 70 catalysts throughout this, this campaign. So we have our little tower here. And with all this uh, ready diversity, we asked ourselves, you know, what chemistry could we unlock through the modularity and the tunability of our peptide catalysts? Um, so we're in a really unique space in order to, to survey a lot of different chemical space through these catalysts. In the field of asymmetric catalysis, generality has been a long-standing gold standard. It can be broadly described as a reaction's ability to be applied to a broad scope of substrates while providing high anti-selectivity in a predictable and reliable fashion. Here we want to highlight two different flavors of generality. The first is what we would classify as a general approach. A great example of this is the asymmetric hydrogenation, which is the most common form of asymmetric catalysis applied on an industrial scale. The reaction was pioneered by Knowles and Noyori and was honored with the 2001 Nobel Prize. In this class of transformations, unsaturated prochiral starting material, such as ketones, alkenes, or amines, are reduced to their corresponding chiral alcohol, alkyne, or amine counterparts, and the reaction is catalyzed by a transition metal catalyst supported by a chiral ligand. While there's no single metal ligand pair that provides high energy selectivity or reactivity across the entire reaction domain of hydrogenation, chances are that through HDE screening of metals and ligands, potentially aided by pre-plated linked libraries, a highly selective catalyst could be identified, making the approach asymmetric hydrogenation general through the catalyst tunability. 
a second kind of generality, a substrate generality within a reaction domain. A greater example of this is a sharpless epoxidation of allylic alcohols. Mechanistically, this reaction proceeds through the coordination of a spectator alcohol to the titanium center. This allows for selective delivery of the oxygen atom to the alkene. While this limits the reaction scope to substrates bearing a practice hydroxyl group, it also makes the sharpless epoxidation general within its reaction domain of allylic alcohols, with almost any substitution pattern allowing for highly enantioselective and chemoselective epoxidation. What we aim to achieve in this study is to harness the nearly limitless tunability of peptide catalyst to optimize for substrate generality within the reaction domain of diol desymmetrization. With this objective in mind, we began thinking about how we can optimize torch generality. For this, I'd like to draw an analogy to a traditional cross-coupling reaction. And if we envision using a 4-promobenzonitrile, a very simple model substrate, we can see that if we would try to expand this reaction to a broader substrate scope, that the reaction might fail. And the challenges here could come in a variety of flavors, for example, more challenging oxidative additions, high steric encumbrance around the reaction center, or for example, coordinating header cycles. Now envision an alternate scenario where we used an electron-rich aryl halide as a model substrate. In this case, the resulting optimal catalyst could most likely successfully convert other substrates featuring challenging oxidative additions. Similarly, other challenges could be overcome by selecting appropriate model substrates, resulting in optimal catalyst systems for each of these substrate classes. Alternatively, though, you could envision a generality-oriented optimization approach, aiming to develop a catalyst system that works for all of these substrates. This would require an optimization substrate set, screening multiple substrates in parallel at the same time. This optimization set should ideally also encode all the chemical diversity encountered within the reaction domain of this cross-coupling reaction. This idea of optimizing for generality via multi-substrate screening has a long-standing history in the field of organic synthesis and has more recently been successfully applied to asymmetric catalysis by a beautiful work from the Jacobson lab. The lead author, Corin Wagen, also been, has been featured on this channel and his work delves a lot deeper into the analytical complexities that are encountered in high throughput optimization of asymmetric reactions, and I highly recommend checking out that episode. Now thinking about how we could apply this to our target reaction of oxidative diol desymmetrization, we first had to identify a suitable set of diols that captures the chemical complexity and diversity of the mesodiols that are encountered in synthetic setting. To do that, we teamed up with Melissa Hardy from the Sigmund Group at the University of Utah. Melissa analyzed and clustered all commercially available mesodiols using molecular fingerprint descriptors and a UMAP for dimensionality reduction. Guided by this representation of the mesodiol chemical space and synthetic availability of the diol candidates, we selected 15 substrates for our optimization set, featuring various header cycle, bicyclic structures, and simple monocyclic structures of various ring sizes a tetrasubstituted diol, a linear diol, and even a 1,5 diol to further enhance the chemical diversity of the optimization set. Through this selection, the optimization set featured many different molecular shapes and potential secondary binding sites, with the diol substructure as a sole molecular motif conserved across all substrates. The workflow that we followed would follow a pretty standard workflow within uh, the Miller group, wherein we would iterate our catalyst design throughout each step of the optimization. So shown here is the peptide that we started with, and we would do point modifications at each replaceable position within the peptide. So shown here are some of the catalytic residues that we incorporated within our peptide backbone. So we can replace you know, a red residue with any number of these red residues and expect the secondary structure to remain uh, roughly the same. And so we could get a lot of information out. From there, we would uh, send these peptides to Cornell, wherein we would screen every single uh, one of the catalysts that we were able to generate against the dials that we had selected on the previous slide. And so if we think about this and we remember how many catalysts that we were able to generate throughout this study, over 70 catalysts against over 15 diols, we can think that this is well into the um, hundreds of, of data points. And so how do we access all of this information efficiently? Utilizing, of course, high throughput analysis. So Cornell team 
uh, utilize well plate, high throughput analysis, uh, cryogenic temperatures. Um, from there, we were really fortunate to be able to use high throughput GC and HPLC analysis in order to rapidly determine catalyst performance. And so since we're focusing on generality, the twist in this optimization approach would be we're not optimizing for a specific enantioselectivity anymore. What we sought to do is optimize for uh, the median ER uh, as a proxy for catalyst performance across a broad range of substrates. And so we're going to end up with heat maps that look a little bit like this. So starting from catalyst P1, delivering a median ER of uh, 16%. We can see a number of point changes are made. Um, two that I'm going to show here will be collected. So we can invert the stereochemistry of phenylalanine at the I plus three residue shown in P2. And this will deliver an increase in the median EE up to 31%. So this was quite a substantial jump. But very curiously, uh, when we changed the C terminal residue from an NN dimethyl to an NH methyl, allowing for uh, new hydrogen bonding interactions, we don't see an increase in the, the median EE as a whole, but we do see large jumps in specific EEs throughout our substrate set. So S1, S5, and S6 had uh, substantial jumps in enantioselectivity from P1 to P3. We were also encouraged by a new crystal structure that we were able to obtain, showing a new secondary structure um, wherein this C-terminal NH is hydrogen bonded to the backbone of our catalyst. Um, and so at this point in time, we decided to incorporate both changes leading, leading to P2 and P3, um, generating P4. Um, and we here first see our hints of a general catalyst um, delivering a median EE of 69%. And so across the board, this really enhances our selectivities. So we are very excited about this catalyst. And from here, we can do single point modifications again. And two modifications that resulted in high enantioselectivities were going from the five-membered proline backbone to a six-membered pipicolic acid, as well as acidification of the C-terminal tail from an NH-methyl to an N-trifluoroethyl. Tail. So catalyst P5 uh, will deliver uh, a median EE of 74%, um, and catalyst P6 delivers 83% uh, uh, EE. And then finally, the combination of these two changes, as well as some small modifications throughout, including a biphenylalanine residue instead of a phenylalanine residue, and a pentafluoropropyl tail instead of a trifluoroethyl tail, delivers up to 93% EE. Also curious is that you'll note the secondary structure of each catalyst changes throughout the generations. And we have a crystal structure of P7 indicating that it's a divergence from what we found in earlier generations and sort of back to the sort of roots where we have one beta turn here and a successive beta turn shown here that will allow for our, our high selectivity. And so with this catalyst in hand, we decided to survey a diverse array of substrates to see if our catalyst could uh, maintain high levels of selectivity, starting uh, with just generic mesodials. Um, so this is a dial that we utilize in our screening set. We can see very high selectivities up to 99% EE, very highly selective for the substrate. But we can also use uh, smaller rings, such as the cyclobutane shown here, delivered in 95% EE. Protected at nitrogen is also efficiently uh, desymmetrized, as well as linear 1,4 dials in 91% EE. Tetra-substituted 1,4 uh, dials are also tolerated within this scaffold, up to 79% uh, EE. We can also efficiently desymmetrize prochiral 1,5 dials. We see a simple aliphatic 1,5 dial shown here, delivered in 76% EE, and a prochiral at phosphorus 1,5 dial, delivered in 82% EE. Notably, we can also tune our catalyst loadings such that we're able to, to drop down to parts per million loadings. Diethylketal lactone, shown here, was efficiently accessed using only 10 parts per million of our catalyst, which at the time of writing the paper was a record for peptide organocatalysis. So we were very excited with the robustness of this catalyst. We were also very excited in utilizing the Lin Lab's expertise in electrochemistry in order to establish an electrochemical method 
that is now tolerant of oxidatively sensitive functional groups, such as olefins, that would deliver these products in, again, high in activities. A relevant synthetic application of our method is the synthesis of the tromboxane A2 antagonist, a fatoban originally discovered by BMS. In this molecule, the blue fragment is derived from the corresponding tyrolactol, which is traditionally accessed from the corresponding mesoanhydride in a five-step sequence. Mesoanhydrides are attractive starting materials due to their efficient synthesis via Diels alder cycloaddition, here from a lake in hydride and furan. The anhydride can be desymmetrized via addition of a stoichiometric chiral alkoxide or with a synchona alkaloid catalyzed methanolysis. Alternatively, an anti selective enzymatic hydrolysis of the dimethyl ester derivatives have been reported. In either case, a product of the desymmetrization step is an ester acid intermediate which then has to be converted to the lactol in a four-step redox sequence. In our approach, we are able to arrive at the same intermediate in only two steps via a global reduction to the mesodiol followed by selective monooxidation. This reaction was carried out at a two millimole scale with one mole percent catalyst loading, and the catalyst could even be successfully recycled two additional times without loss in yield or in anti-selectivity. Notably, this selective monooxidation with little overoxidation to the lactone is uniquely enabled by our optimal peptide catalyst, as we later discovered during the mechanistic studies. With the synthetic utility of the method established, we turned our attention towards the reaction mechanism with a focus on understanding the origin of renantioselectivity across a broad range of substrates. Shown here is a mechanistic scheme for the key enantiodetermining oxidation, where an oxoammonium cation is attacked by a mesodiol providing two diastereomeric alkoxide oxymone complexes, C major and C minor. These complexes can decompose via rate-determining cope type elimination into their corresponding aldehydes. We carried out detailed mechanistic studies into the solution state structure of the oxoammonium cation, the alkoxide oxoammonium complex, and the rate-determining elimination. Here we would like to highlight only one experiment that provides insights into the origin of enantioselectivity but I would invite you to take a look at the paper for a more detailed discussion. In this intramolecular competition experiment, equimolar concentrations of a mesodiol and a simple monoal with a similar steric profile were exposed to catalysts from various stages of the optimization effort, ranging from racemic catalysts to catalysts that were highly selective for the diol desymmetrization. In this experiment, oxidant was used as a limiting reagent which allowed us to determine the selectivity for diol over monol oxidation for each of the catalysts, and we found a very linear correlation between the selectivity for diol oxidation and the selectivity for the diol desymmetrization, shown here in terms of the delta delta G double dagger for the respective transformations. The most energy selective catalyst was able to oxidize diol over monol with a selectivity factor of up to 26. This finding, along with other kinetic data, suggested a mechanistic paradigm where the diol outcompetes the monoal for the formation of a more stable alkoxide oxymonium adduct, supported through hydrogen bonding of the spectator alcohol to the peptide backbone. An analogy in antiselectivity in the catalytic reaction could be a result of a more stable diastereomer of the alkoxide oxymonium adduct or route to the major enantiomer. This result that optimizing towards a general highly enantiated selective catalyst resulted in selection for stronger dial binding raises an interesting point for the generality-oriented optimization. While our optimization set featured many substrate with potential substrate-specific secondary binding sites for peptide-substrate interactions, our multi-substrate screening approach allowed us to sift through the noise and select for the catalyst that binds the only structural motif that is common to all substrates in the optimization set, namely the presence of a secondary uh, spectator hydroxyl group. To further validate this hypothesis, we applied our catalysts that were optimized mainly on 1,4 diodes and 1,5 diodes to the desymmetrization of 1,3 diodes. 1,3 diodes are a substrate class not represented in our optimization set at all. Despite this, we observed high energy selectivities presumably due to the presence of the prequisite diol binding motif. This result further highlights the substrate generality within the reaction domain achieved through our screening approach. On this note, we would like to conclude the talk 
by extending a huge thanks to the Amnoxel team at Cornell, at Yale, and at Utah, without whom the work wouldn't have been possible, the Lin Lab and the Miller Group for constant support, as well as the funding agencies, and of course, Synthesis Workshop for inviting us for this episode. Thank you for tuning in to this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Soren and Jonas for sharing your very interesting research with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments that you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and we'll see you all next time.